<laughs> Where'd you get this character? She's a little fireball too. I know, huh? Yeah. I actually threw her former boss. Who was? Her former boss. You were? No, no, her former boss introduced me. Oh, oh really? Yeah. And uh, the rest is history. Her story. Hi everyone, we are going to be getting started in about one minute, so we're just waiting for all of you to log on and let us know that you're here, and we'll start our formal, formal program then. <coughs> bonjour. Ah, bonjour. Pas bonjour. Pas bonjour. Pas bonjour. On va attendre quelques minutes. <laughs> What's the name of that song? <laughs> An old French lullaby. <laughs> okay, it's four o'clock. I think we should get going. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm Kimberly Charles of Charles Communications Associates in San Francisco. Uh, we are live from New York. It's not Saturday night yet though, it's Friday afternoon the day after Beaujolais Nouveau Day. And we are excited, excited, excited to be here. I would tell you that actually the entire town of Manhattan smells like roses and berries and it's really fresh out there and there's lots of great signs telling people that Beaujolais Nouveau has arrived. Uh, we're su super excited to bring this brand live to you. Uh, this is the first time that we're doing it remotely from outside of California, so that's quite fun. And we have a really very, very special set of guests that we'll be introducing in just a moment. Uh, but we're very, very glad you're with us. I know that for some of you, you may have not received your Nouveau in time because it arrives at midnight on the third Thursday every, month, every year of November. And we tried to ex expedite it to everyone, but I know that trying to get it in a very short period of time was difficult. So if you don't have it, please uh, let us know and we're happy to get a sample to you or you can run out and buy a bottle and enjoy it even faster than that. So we look forward to sharing this next hour with you. I'll be moderating the conversation and what we have very specially today are two gentlemen, uh, Steve Kreps, who is the president of Quintessential Wines, uh, importer, marketer, distributor, set uh, based in Napa, California, and Frank Deboeuf, who is uh, the scion of a very, very famous family in Beaujolais, who've been really the leaders and pioneers and visionaries in this category. So we're going to hear from both gentlemen today, and we really encourage your questions, comments. Our hashtags are hashtag first wine of the harvest. Season, excuse me, first wine of the season. Thank you, Alex, production manager there. And, uh, that, and of course, hashtag Beaujolais Nouveau. And, pardon? De Boeuf Live. De Boeuf Live. All right, good. <laughs> and if you want to say hashtag all the swirl, we'll be happy to have that too. Okay, so good. Um, Steve, would you please tell us a little bit about Quintessential and your relationship with De Boeuf? Quintessential is a import company. Uh, we import brands from all over the United States, from all over the world. Uh, we specialize in family-owned wineries only. Uh, we also like to make sure that there are several generations of families so that it's something that appears to us to be long-term, continuing, family-owned enterprises. Uh, nothing that seems to be made by one, one family member uh, for a plan to sell down the road. Most of our wineries have hundreds of years of uh, tradition and winemaking. Um, we've been doing this since about 2002. This is my 42nd vintage as a wine guy or cork dork or wine geek, whatever phrase you 
prefer to use. We met with the DeBuffs about two years ago. Uh, we thought that they were a great opportunity and a great fit for us because of the family-owned operation. Uh, some people think of them as a big major corporation because of the size and the, and the, uh, the way that they are known all over the world. However, it is truly one of the icons of family operations in the wine business in France. It's uh, quite an operation. The father, George, is obviously very involved. Frank started at the winery in 83, worked his way up to run the winery with his father. Um, his mother answers the phone at the front door. His cousins and aunts and uncles run the warehouse to the facility. So when you talk about it really being a family-owned operation, you couldn't ask for anything more than the way that they do their business. And they are wonderful people all at the same time, which is a big plus. So that's a little commercial for, uh, that was grabbing at a fruit fly. I'm sure you've all done that before. I missed him. Um, <laughs> Very good. Well, Frank, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at the winery. And also, um, I think we should also kick off with talking about the 2016 vintage. Well, I'm Frank Duboeuf, George Duboeuf's son, and uh, we run the company Les Vins Georges Duboeuf, uh, created uh, by my father in uh, 1964, right in the middle of Beaujolais, between Fleury and Moulin Avant, the uh, best Romanesh. Today we represent about 18% uh, of the total production of Beaujolais. Um, we are specialized in the Beaujolais wines and Maconnet wines. Uh, Maconnet wine region is a sister region of Beaujolais where we produce uh, the famous uh, uh, white wines like uh, Pouilly Fissé, Saint Véran and Macon Village. But well, today we are talking about uh, the new wine, uh, the 2016 Beaujolais Nouveau. And uh, another good year, a terrific year, I have to say, uh, uh, we have been uh, extremely blessed by uh, uh, Mother Nature and uh, gave us uh, fabulous grapes, uh, healthy, uh, full of sugar, and uh, uh, the weather condition during the, the harvest were at their optimum. Uh, the growers and the pickers were extremely happy. And uh, well, we, uh, we achieved another great vintage, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, Magical, uh, full of uh, red and black berries, uh, a little hit of spices, but uh, many some uh, wine very uh, uh, vibrant, uh, uh, with a uh, lot of freshness and a long, long finish. Very nice. Well, we're in a setting today. We're in Manhattan in Midtown in a restaurant called Arno, and as you can see, it's very much like a nouveau, Art Nouveau uh, decoration behind us. And throughout France, in all the towns and villages, everybody is happily, happily drinking this wine and will be throughout the holidays and beyond. Uh, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit, Franck, about the history of Nouveau and how it came about and when it came to the States and, and it's your family's role in that. Well, I think every birth is uh, a celebration and uh, Beaujolais Nouveau is no exception. Uh, everything started uh, in the beginning of the 50s, in 1951, the Appellation Beaujolais obtained the, the, uh, uh, the permit to be uh, sold as Nouveau, so that means one month before the official date. So uh, it was on the November the 15th, and then later on in, uh, in, in mid-80s, we changed the date to the third Thursday of November. The date is very important because it's at only at new, uh, midnight on the third Thursday, we celebrate the Nouveau worldwide. Very fun. Mm. And I know Nouveau is, is something obviously that's largely been tr paired with traditional French cuisine. One might say, you know, bistro food and that sort of thing. But what's really exciting about it, and my, I myself as a wine professional for the past 30 plus years, have watched uh, Nouveau really evolve as a, a pairing wine for so many different things, uh, from sushi to you know more exotic ethnic cuisines. So I think that um, it's it's really fun to watch that happen and to see it being enjoyed in all sorts of countries. How many countries do you export Nouveau to? Well, we ship to more than eighty thousand countries. Eight, oh, eighty. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> 80,000 is more. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there are 80,000 countries out there. Maybe sorry. on other planets. 80. 80. <laughs> yes. Got it. Oh, very good. Very good. 
Wonderful. Well, um, let's see. Do you want to talk a tiny bit about the process that, that creates Nouveau, the carbonic maceration, and a little bit more of the technique? And I think it's also important to share that this t technique of winemaking really was the signature in, Bordeaux, in Beaujolais, excuse me, but it's also something that now worldwide is becoming more popular as a technique um, with all sorts of grape varieties, which is pretty great. Yeah, we lose, as you said, the uh, carbonic maceration or Beaujolais fermentation. Uh, the most important thing is uh, all the grapes are picked by hand. So that means we need about 20,000 pickers doing uh, four or five weeks uh, in Beaujolais to pick all the grapes uh, of Beaujolais and Beaujolais village which will be uh, vinified uh, well, in a short time, uh, three, four days, uh, to uh, extract the, the first the color, uh, and then the all the freshness, the aromas, and, the, and then we press uh, the uh, grapes, uh, and, and blend the uh, free run and press juice. So it's a quick process, but it requires a lot of attention. And, uh, and skill, mm. and, and it is true that in Beaujolais for now more than 50 years, we really uh, uh, develop a, an expertise in this type of uh, fermentation, mm -hmm. so we, which enable us to uh, deliver a wine uh, really after 20 days, 25 days of uh, the harvest. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, uh, it requires a lot of equipment, but also a lot of knowledge and expertise, experience from our winemakers. Um, this is a very uh, uh, tough time uh, of the year. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have only a few hours to uh, make uh, a successful Beaujolais Nouveau or uh, something which will not be uh, as aromatic and pleasant uh, we want to be. So it's, uh, uh, again, uh, not an e easy uh, uh, technique and uh, uh, needs a lot of uh, know-how and maîtrise. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Very good. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Um, Steve, you'd like to talk about the fact that you, you want to propose a radical idea for, for New Year's. You talked about <laughs> this. I'd love to hear your ideas. You know, my radical idea for New Year's is usually after a couple of glasses of Beaujolais. <laughs> but you know, being cork dorks as we are, uh, why are we having our new year on January 1st in this country? It doesn't seem normal to me. I mean, at the beginning of the new year, the new vintage, the first wine that's produced, the, the, the new year should be on uh, the third Thursday of November every year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, actually today is the first day of my next year. I'm going <laughs> with that from now. I like it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, obvi obviously, too, with, uh, well, I shouldn't say obviously because we're always learning, but Nouveau is really enjoyed as well, slightly chilled. Um, it obviously is very nice at room temperature, but slightly chilled really mm. brings out a lot of wonderful characteristics. Yeah, it enhances the uh, aromas, the fragrances, and it's very important to sell it slightly chilled. Not too chilled, because sometimes, especially in the, uh, the last uh, years, uh, the last vintages, we, uh, we have a very rich uh, uh, grapes, uh, uh, full of ripeness, so sometimes it, it will um, it will uh, give to the wine a little bit of harsh finish, so it's better to, to serve it between room temperature and slight edge. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And I noticed with this Nouveau that there's a, a really nice base note to it, a lovely structure underneath. It seems to offer everything you want, sort of playful and serious at the same time. You know, lots of enhanced fruit, really charming aromas. And it just feels even more um, to me, having loved this wine for the last 30 years as a Francophile and uh, um, a passionate person about wines for all kinds of occasions. It just, uh, it seems a little bit more too, very, f more food friendly than I recall, which is nice because I usually love it as a quaffable drink, mm -hmm. but it really feels very food friendly now. We had it last night with a reception. We did a wonderful dinner with Rebel, uh, the chef of Rebel, Daniel Eddy. Um, and had some fantastic French food with it. So, um, and it went with everything from saucisson sec to uh, pork rillette to um, you name it, foie gras. It's pretty good. Mm. Yeah, very good. All righty. So, uh, just it probably bears letting people know that this uh, the pricing of this wine, which 
Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about Nuvo and, and its distribution in the U.S. and its pricing? Oh, well, we are obviously national. We're a national sales company. DeBuff is a national brand. Um, we are introducing, as of midnight the other night, the Nouveau. Our plan is to go through the Nouveau, have it clean in all the marketplaces by December the 10th. After all, it is an occasion. It is a celebration. Now, so, some celebrations, I've been at a few that did last for a month or two. But we should be through all the, the Nouveau inventory probably by December the 10th. Mm -hmm. Very good. Wonderful. The region of, of Beaujolais is 34 miles long by 8 miles wide, roughly, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And would you, for those, I know many of you are quite studied, but for those that are sort of orienting themselves to the region, would you describe it a little bit more geologically as well as uh, sort of where the concentration of uh, the crews are and the, the wines that you source for Beaujolais Village as we progress towards the next wine? Yeah, uh, so if we go from the south uh, Beaujolais, uh, the, uh, uh, we are in the Beaujolais area, the simple Beaujolais, as we said, uh, La Région de Pierre Doré, the Golden Stone area, beautiful uh, uh, landscape, and uh, uh, we like to say it is our Tuscany, uh, where it, we produce the Beaujolais Saint, um, known for its aromas and uh, light style, uh, thanks to its soil, which is mainly uh, so, uh, sandy soil, or uh, gives the wine its, uh, again, its style, and uh, uh, its very, uh, uh, with its ability to be uh, vinified uh, as, as nouveau. Uh, then we have, if we go to the north, uh, we uh, enter into the Beaujolais village area, we have 38 villages which are able to produce uh, um, Beaujolais village. Um, they are um, more on the granite uh, soil, so uh, it gives a bit more minerality to the wines and the ability to age, on average, two, three years more than Beaujolais. And then, uh, we have the ten cru uh, area, and the, uh, each village in this area produces their own style wine, and uh, all of them are made with one grape variety, the Gamay. So the differences are coming from the soil. Yes. And obviously the, uh, the exposure. It's true. We were talking yesterday that there aren't too many regions in the world where it's a mono varietal, and you get a chance to have the variable be the terrain which is quite fun, really great. Before we move on to the Beaujolais Village, I would, yes, and I know we have some questions, but I really wanted to take a quick moment to talk about the design of the label this year. And I know, Steve, that we have a lot of, obviously, bloggers who um, have big fan bases and quality fan bases joining us today. So the power of the people with respect to the popular vote, uh, we won't get into politics here. We're just going to talk about popular voting as it relates to wine labels. Mm, she's trying but to silence me already. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. It's not inferring anything. I just realized that when I said that, this is the season of the election. So uh -huh. anyway, um, I'd love to have you share just a bit about the story on the label and also the fact that the label does change, as we know, yearly. Just the, label, the label does change every year, and I guess everyone can see this bottle. Um, what we started with... Oh, there you go. Uh, what we started with is the fruit off to the one side, going flowing up through this vine. It designates summertime. The little chateau, the little house in the middle, bringing back the tradition of Frank and his family. They deal with 300 small mm -hmm. growers, mm -hmm. uh, and they have such. A, they have to taste through. Everybody sometimes thinks that Beaujolais is an easy task. He and his father taste through 3,000 samples to come to the blend that they want to come to. Mm. So we wanted to put in the traditional side of the little chateau. And then from then on, since I can't really see it very well, but I'm going to take it in my hand, the harvest moon, we move on into the stork, bringing the new baby from France to the United States. Another thing that we did a little bit unique, and of course, since you're all bloggers, you have a lot of followers, and a lot of those followers are very active on the internet. 
of which I'm not much of an internet person. I'm getting there. Uh, my brand manager is telling me I need to tweet and Twitter and do these other things. <laughs> so um, we did something a little different with the labels this year. We took 12 labels and we said, why let the trade decide? Why should we decide? Let's let the consumer decide. The people who follow you, which is very important. So we put these 12 labels out and we, in 30 days, much to my disbelief, we had 46,000 people vote on the labels. Mm -hmm. And this was by far and away the winner uh, of the contest. So, Power of the people. The power of the people. Absolutely. Yeah. We used to call it something else in the 60s, but... <laughs> yes. Well, that's what uh, I love about Nouveau. It is really a universally appealing wine to me. It's actually uh, like art or music. You don't have to understand how it's made. You just... And enjoy it and I love that about me both but we're getting into a more serious line of uh, you know in terms of crafting and aging but Alex says there's a few questions yeah there's a couple of questions Rick's chick Liza from Emeryville would like to know a little bit more about the soil and weather actually um, and what's different about this year um, the 2016 vintage mm -hmm. and then fiery 01 red from Dallas would like Thank to know kind of similar line of questioning, what is the climate like in Beaujolais, and does the region endure the Mistral winds? Bricks chicks, what a wonderful day. <laughs> <laughs> well, every vintage has its own story, its unique story, and it's all about the, the, the weather, time, and uh, uh, 2016 was a, a very challenging year. We have had some frost, uh, hailstorms, and uh, um, rainy spring so well we are not in a good mood by the beginning of summer but then uh, the uh, warm days uh, came and uh, we had a, a fantastic weather condition uh, which uh, completed the, uh, the ripeness of the grapes and uh, um, we were very very happy uh, by uh, again the the amount of sunshine. It was one of the warmest uh, um, months of September we ever had for 50 years. So it really uh, bring uh, uh, to the wine its uh, final uh, touch, and uh, uh, we, we we pick the grapes uh, under a beautiful blue sky and uh, uh, with uh, nice weather during the day. Warm temperature, but during the night, cool uh, temperature, which uh, maintain a good acidity uh, and freshness. The first one. And are there kind of similar wind conditions that um, are experienced in the Rhone, that the Mistral winds? Yeah. In the Rhone? Uh, well, well <laughs> similar to the road. Similar, similar to the road. Road. So, yes. ah, no, 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 no. We are above uh, Lyon, so uh, no, it's very different. Uh, even if we have uh, the river Saône, uh, we have some uh, fog and humidity in in the plains. But uh, well, no, it's completely different. We have north wind, which bring mm -hmm. uh, uh, sunshine. We have the uh, east wind, which bring a little bit of humidity and uh, uh, rains. But uh, no, it's very different. Uh, weather conditions um, in 2016 again we, uh, we, we have had some uh, dryness but not as much as uh, the Rhone Valley uh, 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 this year. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, I think we should maybe move along to the Beaujolais Village and we are trying the 2015 vintage and uh, Wonder the one of the wonderful things I know uh, that you felt, Steve, as signing your agreement with the DeBoe family was what a great vintage to start out your relationship with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was really, it was kind of like, let's reel these guys in. Um, the things that, you know, we met with Frank and his father, George, and one of the first, I asked George, I said, how is uh, the 2015 vintage, which would be the vintage that we were going to introduce? This is all Steve. The best since 1947. That's even before I was born. <laughs> uh, so what a great opportunity for us uh, to say, uh, and George and Frank both say, that it's probably the best vintage that they've ever made in the history of the company. Mm. That's spectacular, and that's quite an opportunity for us. We've uh, started focusing immediately on these on the crews and domains and the estates, 
Uh, we're 50% ahead of last year already, mm -hmm. and we've only just introduced these wines not too long ago. So I think we're going to have great success with the 15s. We're very happy to have them. Yeah, I know. We've been tasting some of the crews as well, which we will do shortly. But wow, they're really, really long-lived and elegant and very, very special and unique to their appellation. So, uh, Frank, would you mind elaborating a little bit more on the technical qualities of the 2015 vintage? Uh, Steve said it's one of the best vintage we ever produced in Beaujolais. Um, I would add it to the quintessence of Gamay. Mm. And uh, uh, it is true that uh, um, we went through a beautiful spring and summer and uh, very warm days. Uh, we started the uh, harvest by the end of August, which is very early mm -hmm. uh, compared to this year. Mm -hmm weeks later um, so the the weather conditions were perfect uh, we we have had some uh, very hot very warm temperature so uh, it uh, the uh, sugar level at a very uh, high uh, concentration and uh, uh, it was not an easy vintage to vinify because uh, of this uh, high sugar content and the uh, uh, small amount of juice, mm. um, but well, I mean it's such a pleasure uh, to have these uh, uh, fantastic grapes and, uh, and the, uh, this uh, we turn the challenge, this challenge into opportunities. Absolutely. Uh, and again, uh, we um, uh, we were sure to produce. An incredible English. And well, we, we need time to um, in, introduce this new vintage. I mean, we, uh, we took our time during the vinification. Sometimes we double the time of the um, time of fermentation between 15 to 18 days, mm -hmm. and then we uh, we, we prefer to uh, uh, to age wine a little bit uh, longer in tanks or barrels. Uh, another six months, uh, eight months. So uh, slowly we will introduce a new uh, vintage Very uh, cool. to the market. All right. Well, let's talk about the concept of Beaujolais Village uh, as a as a category. Please uh, describe it a little bit in terms of its position in the hierarchy. Well, uh, Beaujolais Village is a category by itself. Yes. You should say that uh, it's uh, the um, well, the flagship of the the company of the house, yes, yeah. uh, this is certainly uh, where we concentrate the most our uh, experience, skill, and also uh, the the signature wine. So, in a Beaujolais village, we, we capture all the, uh, the gamay uh, characteristics. Uh, you have all these uh, beautiful aromas from. Red berries to red to blackberries, and you have a little bit of spicy notes, a little bit of uh, uh, dark pepper. Uh, sometimes you have uh, uh, some licorice, some cassis, black currant, and always a very, uh, what we want to be the best balance as possible. Something very harmonious, very pleasant, with a fresh aftertaste. Mm. So we uh, we decided to. Uh, always have the freshest uh, uh, vintage so we introduced uh, uh, 2015 very early this year. Mm. Are there specific uh, villages within the region that you tend to work with from a grower perspective? Are there certain villages that have a higher concentration of growers that go into making this wine than others? Well, Beaujolais Village uh, gave the opportunity to work with different uh, areas and uh, as we said we work with more than 300,000 uh, 300 growers and uh, it permitted us to to uh, uh, to select uh, uh, the fruitiness from one specific cellar or maybe uh, the uh, structure from another one mm -hmm. and Beaujolais Village it's really art of blending uh, to my opinion it's uh, very much like champagne in that way, 
correct? Yeah. Yes. A very similar, yes. hand harvested, art of blending. Oui, sure, Lots yes. of growers. Yeah, so, uh, so like a, like a painter, we need a different yes. colors to make a, a nice uh, painting. So exactly. it's, it's the same uh, for Beaujolais Village mm -hmm. to achieve the uh, uh, again the signature one. How how now? There's also a nouveau in this category. There's a nouveau Beaujolais Village. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. how? Uh, how long have you been doing that? I know that there's been Beaujolais Nouveau, but has there always been Beaujolais Village Nouveau? We both uh, are permitted to, uh, to bring these as Nouveau. Okay. Uh, mm. All right. Very nice. Yeah. So I understand, too, that with making this wine, since we have a very sort of technical wine-oriented or audience that knows a lot and wants to learn a lot and share a lot, native yeast is what you use in making these wines? Native yeast? Both. We have uh, selected yeast from Beaujolais, mm -hmm. uh, specifically, and some native yeast, too. Okay. Uh, yeah. Very good. And this is twelve ninety nine retail, suggested nationally, which is great. What would you pair with this normally at your home, Frank? If we were to be invited to mm -hmm. dinner, if we were to be the honored guest at your house, what would you serve us? It's a very easy wine, a good... Um, Food companion, so I will recommend to um, any uh, picnic or uh, uh, to serve it slightly chill as a uh, um, uh, welcome drink, or it can be uh, served with uh, pizza, salads. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to have a glass of Beaujolais Village with pizza, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I think it matches very well with the uh, tomato acidity. And yeah. And, and, and also uh, with. Um, Cold cut. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Charcuterie. Charcuterie. Yes. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> We're getting hungry over here in New York towards the end of the afternoon. Yum. Okay. Um, let's see. Do we have any questions about this particular wine, Alex? No questions, just lots of great comments. People are yeah, I'd love to hear a few of them. What are people sure. saying? Great. Yeah, just saying that this is a, a obviously our, our California viewers um, tuning in are enjoying this with lunch, and they're saying these are just kind of the most perfect lunch <laughs> wines that they, they could have had. Um, Liza from Emeryville again is on saying um, warm fruit aromas, Luscious gamay, an elegant, expressive label, perfect hostess good. Really nice. Yeah. Well, thanks, California, for joining us mm -hmm. earlier than our normally scheduled time. Uh, Frank is actually getting back on a plane to France tonight. So uh, we, we wanted to get this at a time that was appropriate, lunch. Let's say you're working. It's te technically a working lunch. So thanks for joining us at this particular moment. Okay, good. Well, I, um, I think that it might be fun to progress along to the crew of the Beaujolais. Uh, we have two this, this afternoon um, that we are showcasing, the La Madone Fleury. And um, in terms of all the crews of Beaujolais, would you discuss a little bit more about that concept, about the 10 crews that are existing and also within your portfolio, all the crews that you work with? Mm -hmm. Well, so now we are okay, you know, doing a new family of wine. Uh, so. As I said, all produced from the same grape varietal, Gamay grape, 100%. Um, in the Cru uh, family, we have 10 different uh, expressions, mm -hmm. 10 different villages. Uh, there is no other classification, so it's mainly uh, by your own personal taste and uh, favorite. Uh, so there is a scale in terms of intensity uh, and ability to edge. So from the lightest, uh, we usually start with a Rainier or a Brouilly, and then we have a Chiron, Côte de Brouilly, and then we have a, a second uh, group of uh, uh, Cru, a little bit more um, richer and uh, full-bodied, mm -hmm. with the Morgon, Fleury, and we have Saint Amour, Chena, and they finish with Moulin Avant. I hope I don't forget you. I think we got everybody. It sounded <laughs> like 10 to me. Yeah. Somebody tell us if we missed one. <laughs> so, and the differences are, again, coming from the soil. It's amazing to see uh, this uh, mosaic of souls in, in Beaujolais. Sometimes you just cross the, the road and you have a different appellation thanks to, uh, to its soil. Uh, it gives to the fruit um, its um, 
characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know that uh, the woods uh, go deep uh, to, uh, to add their nutrients, sometimes 15 meters. So uh, in Beaujolais, it's mainly granite, but not only. We have caiso, we have limestone, we have schist, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, minerals, uh, iron, manganese. So all these um, components gives to uh, each of the crew its own personnel. Mm -hmm. Its own signature. Yeah. And yesterday you were telling me a bit about the viticulture in, in the region and how depending on where uh, the crew is or even other uh, other vines that are planted that can be the gobelet style, which we all know is the lower head trained, uh, closer to the ground style of, of training vines, or not training them in that case, um, as well as more traditional trellis. Mm -hmm. training. So would you speak a little bit about how that is expressed in Beaujolais? Well, uh, Gabi is a very generous uh, grape varietal. So, uh, we we uh, used to have a very high density per hectare, uh, between 8,000 to 10,000 uh, vines per hectare, uh, to, uh, to refrain with this uh, generosity. And we have also the uh, short pruning called uh, Taillon Goblet. Uh, but today, um, we are a little bit less density, and we are uh, we have an evolution uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, on wires, okay, and uh, uh, so it's much better. It's much uh, around six hundred to eight and, uh, six thousand to eight thousand uh, vans per acre. We've been running Frank hard in New York, <laughs> so you know, and he's had a typical New York life for the past two days. You pretty much haven't mm -hmm. stopped, right, with meetings and things. So <laughs> just fun, just fun. We've had a good time. Yeah, we sure. really have, yeah. absolutely. Um, that's really fun to hear, and thank you for that. So you're saying, in other words, that the high density plantings mm -hmm. help mitigate the generosity of the gamay grape. It sort of tames the beast a little bit because it can be so. Mm -hmm. Fresh floral fruity, but if you do do the concentration of the vines per, per hectare, you get a little bit more structure and, and architecture to the wine. Is that did I hear you correctly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yes. Yeah, so just to just to, to uh, refer a little bit the uh, uh, again the uh, vegetation. Uh, so uh, we are on poor uh, soil, so mm -hmm. it's important also to maintain. Uh, Again, the potentiality and the, uh, the, uh, the ability to the plant uh, to, uh, to survive. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, but uh, uh, well, it's, again, yes, it's, it's, uh, uh, the, the, uh, this was the old way to, uh, uh, to maintain uh, a certain crop. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Well, let's talk a little bit about the property La Madone oh, we've got and the crew, Fleury. But before we do that, we will definitely take some questions because we love hearing from you. So please. Yes. So Nancy from California would like to know, is vinification for your crew wines very different from the others? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's a good question. Yes. Yeah, because uh, after the soil, again, the uh, art is extremely important. It will give uh, the, the final style to the to the wine and uh, the, uh, the fermentation is uh, very different in, in some cases uh, we usually have a longer uh, period of time of uh, first fermentation uh, after fermentation and uh, also different technique sometimes uh, uh, we crushed uh, sometimes uh, we, uh, we steam uh, and, uh, sometimes uh, we have uh, much longer uh, fermentation in, in a big wooden vat, for example. So, uh, yeah, uh, with the cru, we try to have uh, more well, density, structure to the wine, and so we find the tannin. Uh, so, compared to a Beaujolais, uh, usually we have uh, two or three days of uh, fermentation. With the cru, we have, we have eight, ten days, and even more. Mm -hmm. And what else? Um, and Michelle from Dallas has done some homework, and she read that all crews located north of the Miserand River 
um, are located north of the Nizaran River, and she's wondering what is it about that location that lends itself to crew quality? Up to Nizaran, mm -hmm. we, uh, it is true that we have a couple of uh, rivers we delimit the, uh, the areas, and the Nizaran is the uh, southern frontier, uh, uh, south frontier. Borders. Border, mm -hmm. yeah, so, and uh, okay. uh, on the north we have uh, La Mauvaise, a small river. Well, there is no influence into the, uh, the vineyards uh, close by, but uh, uh, geographically, yes, this is the, uh, where we have the crew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought I might just remind everyone about our hashtags, just in case you maybe joined us a little bit later. It's hashtag Deboeuf Lai, D-U-B-O-E-U-F. And uh, first wine of the season, hashtag first wine of the season, and hashtag Beaujolais Nouveau. Let's get those political hashtags off of tr uh, Twitter Live and talk about the really fun stuff, please. <laughs> Let's do it. All right, so I would like, I know we need to talk about Fleury and we need to talk about Morgon upcoming. Before we do that, I thought we should maybe quickly tell people about Le Hameau. I hope that all of you um, love France as much as we do at Charles Com. Um, I know it's a huge part of your portfolio. Absolutely. You guys are extremely serious about France, and you have been all your career, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you know, one of the things that I think is wonderful about the Deboeuf family is they have traveled around, they've seen the globe, and they understand what it's like to welcome visitors. And actually, if you go to Le Hameau at, at uh, Georges Deboeuf, you will likely meet your wife, who is uh, front and center there. She's the mm -hmm. ambassador of the region. So tell us a little bit more about that experience and how it came to be, because definitely, you know, we would love to be able to um, make that happen if you are planning a visit to France. So maybe Frank can give us a little preview of coming attractions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in 1993, uh, I first opened uh, a wine museum, a kind of wine museum, uh, thanks to its uh, numerous uh, travels, visits, like you said, in, in Napa Valley, we found that, and also a real passion to share uh, is uh, passion for wines and, and, uh, and to entertain uh, a guest, he opened uh, the, uh, the door of, uh, of uh, our cellar and to uh, a world which is sometimes a little bit uh, Secret, private, uh, private, really, and, yeah, uh, and mysterious. So, uh, we we open a place uh, with the idea to entertain our, our guests and really to uh, uh, to be uh, really approachable. Mm. And we want to give to uh, um, as much as we, we can um, information, history, uh, all the uh, technical aspects, but also to uh, really please the whole family. I mean children and uh, mm -hmm. young generation, wine experts, but also uh, people who would like to know a little bit more about wine. Um, so this is uh, uh, a, a, a destination by itself, Yes. Uh -huh. uh, where we have now uh, uh, a restaurant, and uh, actually we triple the size of the uh, previous uh, uh, Arbeau du Boeuf, the, uh, the museum. Uh, and uh, my wife Anne and myself now we we, uh, we run this uh, uh, this place. It's open uh, seven days a week all, mm. the, all the year wow. uh, long, and uh, well, twenty people uh, that work there, uh, and we receive about uh, eighty thousand uh, visitors a year. Wow, very good for you. So, but yeah, it's it. and that's such, it's very unusual, really. I mean, France has been sort of the paragon of making fine wine for many, many categories, as we know. But this whole notion of visitation and interaction with producers is not culturally uh, as prominent. But you've definitely helped innovate within the country itself, and that's really fantastic. I'm sure you've inspired a lot of your colleagues to um, open their doors. I remember one time I was visiting Provence, and there was a sign that said, "Come and visit us," but the se section where it had the hours was cut out and I learned that the owner was tired of people showing up at any time during the day, especially at lunch when they were enjoying their meals and didn't want anybody to visit so he cut out the uh, come visit us part. <laughs> so anyway, um, it's, it's great that you're doing that and I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to actually experiencing it myself one day. And the other thing I love about 
you know, you mentioned family, and uh, I personally think it's a lot of fun when you can go to a, an experience with a winery and children can learn about aroma and, and smell and maybe even have a taste experience. It's not wine, but, but shows a texture or shows, you know, something educational. And I know that's a very big thing, too, in the, in the French education system. Children are learned, they learn about flavor and yes, aroma and textures. textures. Yes. And it's... It's a great, it's obviously why you all are gastronomes that are known worldwide, but it's great that they learned that at an early age. So, but anyway, back to, back to the wines. Um, so what, One more I, thing. Yeah. Because I just have to say this, because we're all in the industry. Yeah. All you bloggers out there. When you go to Beaujolais and you get to the Hameau, if you don't ask for Anne de Buff, you're missing half the whole show. <laughs> this woman has more personality and is more outgoing than any one human being should have in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And if you do not meet Anne and travel through the Homo with her, you're missing a big part. Okay. So please ask for There her. you go. There you go. So get, get France on your, uh, on your itinerary for 2017 or sooner if you want, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay, good. Well, let it, let's talk a little bit about the property La Madone and the Cru Fleury. Mm -hmm. Please. So uh, we, uh, we get two uh, crues of Beaujolais, uh, Morgon and Fleury, and uh, very specific. Uh, the first uh, wine we will taste is uh, Fleury La Madone. La Madone is a climate, a climat, a climate of uh, the appellation. I said there is no classification in, within the uh, cru of Beaujolais, but uh, we have some uh, climate. Uh, and La Madone is one of, uh, of the Fleury uh, appellation. Uh, La Madone means uh, the La Madonna, a little chapel on, on the top of the hill, a beautiful uh, area, uh, a, a nice exposure, uh, again, south, south, east. So um, it's uh, from a specific area within the appellation, and it's really to uh, it gives you um, then, um, um, a view of uh, a d specific area uh, and uh, the potentiality of the Fleury, which we describe usually as the Queen of Beaujolais because of its elegance and finesse. Mm. We have a lot of floral uh, aromas, peony, ice, then we have, have some spicy notes, some mm -hmm. uh, uh, black leaf. A reglisse uh, a little. A little bit of reglisse. Which yes. is licorice. And, mm -hmm. and then you have this black uh, fruit uh, flavors. And, uh, and you have this uh, uh, very uh, warmness and even some uh, sucrosité. Mm -hmm. uh, this vintage uh, really show beautiful uh, structure, yeah. body, and uh, with a very refined Time. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it gives uh, to the persistent wine. as well. Persistence, very yes. persistent yes. on the palate, but mm. very sort of, I always call it a very muscular ballerina. You know, mm -hmm. she's <laughs> very toned and, and she's strong and uh, she's got her finesse, but she's also got her strength, which is great. Yeah. And the soil type in Fleury, we were talking about this yesterday. Would you describe it a little bit more? I will, I will sum up as a, as a generality. A yes, it's very granite. Mm, it's uh, pink and granite when you, uh, uh, when you pass through this appellation. You, uh, you see like uh, a pink uh, soil, sand, but actually it's not uh, sand, it's uh, uh, rocks. You've had the uh, erosion and the human work. Uh, decomposed it a bit, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's very uh, rocky. Uh, Base. Mm. Very cool. Yep. Well, some questions. Okay, good. And I also mm -hmm. wanted to say that Frank mentioned this week that um, some very um, detailed so soil maps. For those of you, I know Fred Swan, NorCal Wine, you're out there and you teach a lot. Um, for those that, of you that want to go even walk here, let us know because there are some really brand new, well, relatively new soil maps that have gone into great detail for the mm -hmm. enti you know, entire square mileage of the, of the region. So those of you that would like to get into that for either educating others or for yourself, let us know. Please just reach out at press at Charles Com and we'll make sure we get you good materials. So yes, Alex, we've got some questions. 
Okay, so Dezel Quillen of My Vine Spot from Virginia. He asks, many consumers regard Beaujolais as easy drinking with no to low tannins, but there are some young tannins in the Fleury. Does, does this come from sight, skins, winemaking technique, etc.? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Gamay Grape has a white juice, so we obtain the colors and the tannins from the skin and from the seeds. So the, the time of uh, fermentation is very important. And uh, as I said, the uh, more you, uh, you let the grapes uh, kind of skin contact, or, uh, the more you will obtain uh, colors and, and uh, tanning again. So uh, yes, definitely, it's, it's uh, thanks to uh, a full ripeness, uh, the characteristic of this vintage, and also the, uh, the technique which can extract more from the grapes uh, enable us to have this refined tannin. I noted that it, it says in your technical notes that it's semi-carbonic maceration and malolactic together to make this particular wine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, we mm -hmm. have to go through the malolactic, uh, then it's the second fermentation before the, the bottling. And then the vines from this property are 20 years old, roughly on average, is that mm, right? Much more? more? Much, much more? more? Okay, this is... A generalization, then. Yeah. So they're how yes. how far back would you say they go? Oh, Sixty uh, to eighty. Oh, that's yeah. young, right, Steve? Oh, sure. <laughs> 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 I was going to ask you. I think you might have mentioned this, but I need to remember what what is the oldest Beaujolais you tasted? Let's say from the cruise or ah, oh. yeah. And well, how did, did you enjoy uh, it? I had the opportunity to taste it in 1945, 1947. How old were you when you, or how, how, uh, what, so what, yeah, how long had they been, what was their age at the time? Well, it was about 15 work? years ago, and wow. I still have a couple of bottles at home, but, uh, well, it's, uh, I'm waiting for a very special occasion. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, you mean when Kimberly and I arrive? Yeah, <laughs> of course, yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm a vertical. student, I, I majored in history, so uh, do, uh, I consider that to be, uh, <laughs> Good. keeping myself keen. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, well, we had also the opportunity to taste some uh, great Beaujolais from the uh, 70s and 80s uh, years, uh, and, mm -hmm. and they were uh, very, very good. So, so uh, please don't let the secret out, everybody, because the Cru Beaujolais in particular, when they have age on them, I'm sure many of you know this, but... Um, it's one of those things where it's like when you go to a great restaurant and you don't want too many people to know about it because it will become crowded and you can't get your favorite table anymore. I think the same thing happens with Cru Beaujolais. You know, when you, uh, it's, 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 I think, undervalued, definitely. And I think that it also is something that ages gracefully and beautifully, like we all hope to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it can really, really, really surprise you. And it takes on very interesting characteristics with its development. I mean, what do you find aromatically and flavor-wise in older Beaujolais? But, you know, we know the primary experience you have mm -hmm. with the younger wines, but what do you tend to pick up? Well, it would be uh, pretty close to uh, the Pinot uh, in characteristics. So there's still a very uh, sort of uh, fruit macéré mm -hmm. and, some, uh, and uh, still a lot of, uh, uh, well, a nice uh, balance between, again, the aromas and, and the freshness uh, and uh, uh, very uh, the, uh, fine, uh, Tanning, obviously, and uh, a lot of elegance. So, uh, um, but it's quite an experience mm -hmm. uh, to try an old Beaujolais. And, uh, well, it can be confusing with some great wine. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. good stumper wine, that's for sure. Um, I don't know how many of you follow the When Wine app, um, something we're really passionate about at Charlescom. It's the biodynamic calendar and it's on an app and it tells you whether it's a fruit day, a flower day, a root day. And uh, today happens to be a pretty auspicious day for our tasting. It's a flower day um, up until 6 p.m. I think our time. So our timing is impeccable, very good. Um, so yeah, I, it's a really fun thing to do with yourself to, um, to get this app. There's a free version of it and there's a paid version, but the free version is really fun because um, you can say, hmm, I think these wines are not really tasting fantastic today. And sure enough, it's a root day. But today we, we lucked out and of course, the flower on the label of the traditional Georges de Boeuf, um, many of them are decorated as you can see here, the Bleu Blanc Rouge, which is the drapeau Francais, the French flag. 
So the flower label is quite um, prominent for you. And maybe maybe we should take a quick second. I know we need to go to the Morgan, but just talk about the flower label concept in general so that people understand what oh. that means to you. Well, um, my father created these flower labels in the, uh, in the, in the 70s. It was a, uh, quite a revolution at the time. And to, uh, Second to French Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but we always pay a lot of attention to the presentation to our wine. Mm -hmm. It's extremely important. This is the first message that the consumer will get. So uh, it's a kind of uh, identity card. Huh? You have all mm -hmm. dimension, but also uh, it, it gives the first impression uh, about the one. So uh, uh, mm, nothing is better than some uh, uh, white flowers. Nothing very sophisticated. Huh? If you look, at, you look at carefully, there is no uh, uh, ornate. Mm -hmm. no, maybe uh, fleur de champ, as we said. Huh? Uh, uh, wildflowers. Yeah, wildflowers. Wildflowers. And um, it's we. Uh, I think it goes very well with our uh, style mm -hmm. uh, and with the Beaujolais wines. Well, good. It's a perfect flower day. Mm -hmm. As I expected, um, you know, our time is, is is slipping away, and I don't want Frank to get back on a plane to France, but he must. Um, and so we've got about seven minutes left, and we do need to talk about the Jean Hermès des Um So this is a Morgan wine, and I. I know it speaks for itself, but Frank, please talk about the property and the grower. Um, I know that uh, it's a long-term relationship for you and that his daughter has taken over uh, helping with the, yeah. the, the growing and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm going to be quiet and let you talk. So this is another example of what we are doing in Beaujolais. And uh, we, since the beginning, my father paid a lot of importance to uh, the relationship with the growers as a grower himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to really promote uh, the um, uh, growers' work, and he, he decided to bottle the wine at the property, and also to, to, uh, to sell the wines under their own label with their name. And Jean Esto de Con was one of the first uh, uh, to we, we work with uh, for now 50 years, and uh, we. Uh, Sometimes we, we work not only the first, second, but the third generation. Um, so it's very important for us these kind of relationships based on trust and confidence. And uh, you told me a handshake, no contracts. Uh, most yeah, times. yes. <laughs> At the beginning, Which is it was very like refreshing <laughs> in this litigious world we live in. That's for sure. That's very important yeah. for us. And uh, we we carry more than 100 different domains and chateaux in our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the way we, we like to work. Huh? We have the uh, wine from different growers, and uh, and uh, we, we like very much to uh, uh, to do some tailor-made. The cousu main with all these uh, domains, so we um, we check carefully uh, the date of bottling, and uh, and then uh, our pleasure is when our uh, importers, uh, customers come to uh, to our cellar, and we can taste all of the dif different domains, and they choose uh, the one they, they want to uh, to sell. So. And I understand Jean Ernest was quite a personality from what I read, yes? Yes. Didn't he do a lot for Beaujolais as a region? Definitely, yes. He was a, a great character, a uh, monsieur, extremely generous. He told me he opened uh, 3,000 3, bottles a year in his cellar. Wow. So the door was always open to friends and visitors. But during the vinification, the harvest, he closed the door and he slept near, uh, near in, in the cellar. He was mm. a, so he was very professional, very serious, but a very generous man mm. as, as the wine. Absolutely. <laughs> and of course, the, the, the vines speak to all of his hard work, 50 to 100 year old vines in this vineyard, correct? And mm -hmm. 29 hectares, so relatively small. And you know, that is the wonderful thing about the cruise is there are only a couple thousand cases made and Steve, how much have we been able to get into this country? Please? Not enough. <laughs> I know, right? We have to fight. We're going to arm wrestle later before he goes first. Away. <laughs> ah, okay. Good point. Good point. I know. It's true. I think we have a couple of questions, and I know we're getting close to, to wrapping. I know we have a few extra minutes, um, but yes, please. 
Um, first of all, the Morgan is far and away, I think, the favorite <laughs> right now of the tasting. Mm -hmm. um, everyone was loving kind of the quality to price ratio. Um, when Kimberly mentioned we had seven minutes left, there was um, someone said seven minutes in heaven with this Morgan. <laughs> Thank you for such a wonderful mm -hmm. wine. Yeah, super um, cool. yeah. <laughs> we do have a question from Kovas from Illinois. And he would like to know, are the Clemats usually a single family or multiple owners? Multiple owners. They are not a, a monopoly. It's mainly uh, yeah, a, a small area within the appellation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it could be, um, a analogy would maybe be like Clos Bougeot, for instance, which mm -hmm. is a monopole, but then within it, many different people that own vines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm in love, in love with this Morgon. It is really, really broad-shouldered and, and full of complexity and um, the color, as you said, it really, the color speaks to the vintage. We really, we don't need to say much when we look at this glass because it's, uh, it tells us almost all we need to know. I find a little bit of a graphite edge in it, which I love, you know, uh, we a little bit. A bit graphite, really, yes. with some saline notes, yes. or salted. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, uh, even some uh, yeah, licorice, a lot of uh, black cherries, morello, uh, mm -hmm. and which uh, will turn to uh, more kirsch uh, flavors in maybe two years or three years. But definitely, it's uh, a wine that you can keep in your cellar for at least two decades. Yeah, uh, I wanted to take a quick look. I was going to ask maybe two for Steve, you know. What I love, uh, you do, do you see the Georges de Boeuf anchored on the grower labels? And is that uniform now, or is that something that's uh, coming through? Just because I know you tend to defer to the growers, but show that you have your relationship and contract with them. Definitely. Mm -hmm. No, we're all three attached at the hip. Yeah. Um, so you'll see that on all the labels. You'll see the quintessential wines on the back for legal reasons. Uh -huh. uh, one thing I'd li like to add about the Morgon, since everybody's loving it as much as I am right now, I have met the daughter of Jean Moscombs. She is quite a character. She's quite a lovely person. She is just as generous as her father was. Uh, while we were there, uh, she opened a bottle of 1974 for us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you weren't there, so I felt <laughs> really bad for you. The fewer people, the better is what I say. <laughs> older wines open. But you know, one of, <laughs> one of the other people that were with me on the trip that day, he picked it up and he said, you know what? He says, this is probably one of those wines they drink on Mount Olympus. Yeah, no kidding. This is true. <laughs> this is really true. Well, wonderful. Yes, we have, are we close to any more questions? Or? One more question. Okay, we will wrap up with one more question and then we have a toast we want to share with you. Okay. And this is coming from Jenna Francisco in California. Hi, Jenna. And she would like to know what you would like the U.S. market to know about Dubuque wines. Ah, uh, well, uh, well, we are a Beaujolais uh, specialist, so I really would like to have uh, uh, the same success as we have with the Nouveau, with all the Cru of Beaujolais. And these are wines to be uh, rediscovered and uh, they are great wines for uh, a new generation of consumers. Uh, uh, it's fruitiness, it's style, and uh, it's value too. So uh, um, I really would like to see a more cru uh, of Beaujolais on the table mm -hmm. here in the US. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. I do think that um, what I love about the region is that it offers something for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't mean by, by any means do I mean that Nouveau is something for somebody with a sort of a general basic knowledge, although you don't require any knowledge to appreciate it. Um, because even, I found this very interesting. A lot of people who um, collect wine love to drink Nouveau. They'll tell you it is their favorite thing that they love to have in their fridge. Um, I know several prominent retailers here in New York who have told us, told us that, so that's really fun. And it's, so if you want to be contemplative or you want to be more playful, you have everything to offer, which is great. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty wonderful. So I, I'd love to toast to that. What is your favorite toast in French? Merci. Santé. Santé, okay. Santé. To your health, because we know this will definitely stuff. help it. Mm. <laughs>
Thank, thank you, you very, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Yes, and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Happy um, festive season. Yes. Happy Beaujolais Nouveau Doe, and more important, happy New Year. Yeah, happy New Year with Nouveau for sure. All right. Good night, everyone.